welcome to episode 16 of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I'm glad you could join tonight. I'm sure there'll be a lot of other people joining soon. And of course, you can always watch this uh, afterwards too. So I know there's some people with things going on tonight and they can't be live and they wanted to be, but that's okay. It'll be on uh, the POA Facebook on Facebook on the POA history page. It'll be on there forever. So you just have to join. I want to thank everyone for joining that group. We have over 1800 members of that group. It started out as POA history and now it's called or POA trivia. And now it's called POA history. It's been over 10 years since I started that group on Facebook and it's just built into this. And now it's the home of uh, my POA podcast, which isn't a traditional podcast. Uh, I know everybody and their uncle has a podcast now, literally. Uh, but this is a live video podcast so of course we have a lot of pictures always tonight now it's going to be a little different show tonight's about the leading lists the leading breeders and leading sires of national champions in the POA breed so I don't have pictures but I have a lot of words and numbers uh, if you like looking at pictures and like the looks of POAs and stuff but you're not into a lot of the the bloodlines, this might be a show to learn some stuff, or you might get bored with it, but the people that are really into the pedigrees and the bloodlines and who did what and the up-and-comers, the people that are coming up the list, uh, then you're going to find a lot tonight about that. So uh, we do have a lot to get through. It'll be a fairly long show. Hopefully it doesn't cut out. Hello, Mark. I got thumbs up from Mark. Uh, hope There's Jan Rogers. Good. Hopefully Tracy is... Uh, going to join us. I know she's in Georgia at the Astons, who they'll be mentioned tonight. Of course, so will Jan and Mark, and a lot of POA breeders will be mentioned in their families, and a lot of stallions will be mentioned tonight, too. So, first of all, I want to get to uh, my sponsorship tonight, which is my wife. Uh, of course, uh, like I mentioned, Tracy Keene is going to be in, is in Georgia because she's headed to the International Show, or the Congress, excuse me, the National Congress, So, which is going to start Saturday. She's going to be there early for some meetings and stuff, I imagine. So she's already traveling to avoid the storm there in Florida. I know some other people are on the road. Uh, Sean from Wisconsin, or from uh, California, and I'm sure there's some other people on the road as well. So safe travels to everyone. Now, my wife is going to be there with me because I'm going to be at the show uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and then we're moving on to do some stuff, taking a vacation. But I, I'm excited to see people that I haven't seen for a while. I missed last year's show. I didn't attend uh, mainly because of COVID and some other things too, but I hadn't missed one in quite a few years because it's just down the road about an hour and a half from where I'm sitting tonight. Uh, but Monica, of course, my wife, she owns the Pastry Nook uh, Bakery and Bistro, and that's in Enid here. It's a little deli and bakery, and uh, she makes everything from scratch pretty much. So uh, she's got a little list here, as you can see, uh, cupcakes, Cake pops, bars, French pastry box, French mac macarons, cookies, different flavors of those, cinnamon rolls and stuff like that, Danish, Muddy Buddies. A lot of people ask what Muddy Buddies are. I have some pictures of some of that stuff. Uh, so anyway, uh, why this is listed tonight is because we're going to be there Saturday morning. We're going to leave early so she can make the stuff this week. She needs the orders in by tomorrow. There's a few people already placed orders. So if you're going to be at the show and you want something for your kids or you to snack on or whatever, or you want some gifts for somebody, some of the stuff makes really good gifts. So here's some Muddy Buddies. She makes like 12 or 13 different flavors, and uh, some people's ordered those already. Here's her avalanche bark. If you like peanut butter, this is a popular one for kids. And then these are cake pops. She can decorate them in different ways. Chocolate chip cookies. Those are made right here in Enid at the bakery. Of course, one of her most popular ones are lemon cookies. So there's a picture of lemon cookies. So hopefully you ain't getting too hungry tonight. But if you're going to be at the show and like I say, you want a snack or you want to surprise somebody, Please get your orders in by tomorrow. There's been a lot of people that's already been ordering the last week or two. So uh, I think it's like noon or something by tomorrow. And uh, her phone number's on there. Or you can contact me or just look up Google the Pastry Nook in Enid, Oklahoma. So again, tonight we're going to talk about the leading breeders and sires list. And uh, this is something I started in 1993. And I want to tell you a little story about how I started it. 
And uh, well, Mark Lammers said, looking tasty. Yeah, too bad you're not coming to Tulsa, Mark. I could get you a, a lemon bar or a lemon cookie or something. Uh, but anyway, uh, we started these lists, in, uh, or I did, in 1993. And uh, I haven't told the story ever before about how they started uh, publicly, but um, we went to visit a, a place. We went to Gene Carr's place, my dad and I. And uh, on the way back, my dad said, I want to find out how many national champions we raised and how many genes raised just in comparison. He goes, I know he's bred for more than we have. You know, he has a lot more numbers, 50, 60 folds, but I just want to see kind of a measuring stick where we're at. And I said, well, that would be pretty hard to do, Dad. I'd have to look up everybody, you know. And then he said, well, how would you do that? And I, we started talking. Of course, it's a three-hour drive. It was a three-hour drive from uh, – our place out to Hayti, South Dakota. Hi, Dave. Dave Morris is joining us. Um, so we, uh, I got home and I started looking up the show results and I had them in magazines. Thanks to Aaron Jewell. I had all his collection of magazines and I'd look at the show results. And then in 1987, when I was, well, like 15 or so for my birthday, my mom and dad got me all the stud books from the first one until 87. They got me that for Christmas, and that was a pretty cool gift because they knew I liked researching and stuff, and that gift came in handy to build these lists. In fact, I wouldn't have been able to do it without it. So when we got home, you know, I think it was a weekend, and I, uh, I tore open the stud books, and I started looking at the show results, and I started at 1980. I mentioned this last week in part two of the Salty episode. Uh, I started with the 1980 show and went up to 1992 because the 93 show hadn't happened yet. This was in the spring, I believe. So that means since then, I've updated these lists 28 different times. I just got done last night updating it for the 28th time. I didn't, uh, I kind of drug my feet this year, but I have to update them before the next show. Otherwise, I'm going to get real way behind. So I finally updated it, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, some of the people that helped me this year to update it. But uh, so in 93, I did that, and it was pretty well received by some people right away. Uh, Lynn Puffenbarger was number one, and he made a comment again last week. He said, just think if you went back all the way from the beginning. And I said, all right, well, I will. So I had to start getting other show results. I didn't have all the magazines from the beginning. So I contacted one of the uh, older historians that I knew at the time, and that was Ruth Picoy. And she found a few show results I didn't have. And then she contacted Jean Adams from Nebraska. She was the Star Acres person, had Coretz Indian Boy, raised a lot of good Star Acres POAs. And Jean came up with the ones that Ruth didn't have. So between those two ladies and myself, we ended up with all the show results from 1959 up until I already had them to 80. So I had them back until I was missing about eight shows, six to eight shows is what I was missing in my collection. And they helped me find that. Now, since then, I've got most of the magazines from other people. So I have pretty much all of them anyway in magazines. But what I had to do is I had to look up. So each time a POA would win a class, I would uh, look up their breeder and then I'd look up their sire. And on one page in a notebook, just much like this right here, I got a lot of notebooks at my house. Uh, I kind of got nervous when I started watching CSI. But anyway, I got notebooks full of POA information. And uh, when they'd win a class, I'd mark one. And then when they'd win, if they won another class, I'd mark another little you know, mark, tally mark. And then if they won five, I'd put the one across like that. And I had an H for the first column and a P for the second column. Uh, and the second column was performance, halter and performance. Anything that wasn't halter fell into performance. So it might have been Gymkhana or games, stuff like that, jumping, you know, trail, anything that was back then there wasn't a uh, lunge line, but there was a lot of cart, there was racing. So racing and all that went under performance. And as I did it, you know, there wasn't as many faturities as there is now during the national show. So I didn't include the faturities, and I still don't, which I wish I would have. It's too late to really go back and do it now. I mean, I've bred for a Leonard Lewis winner and a McLaren winner, Kiddo Tough, the stallion that my family bred, uh, sired three McLaren winners. So it would have helped me. Uh, personally, but it's just something that I did. You got to remember, I was 21 years old when I was doing these lists. I was basically all by myself. I did it, uh, you know, sitting 
sitting on a couch with it on my legs or I would be on a ki- at a kitchen table and every year I'd update it. At first, I used to type it. I know I got uh, crap about that from people like Pat Burton and Dave Morris and people like that later. They said, do you type that out every year? But I actually would. I'd retype it every year. Now I copy and paste. I don't like uh, just Word. I like Word programs. I don't like data sheets and stuff like that. I, I just never did like those. I don't like how tiny the numbers are and stuff and the lines. So I just do it in a Word program. And again, I've updated it uh, 28 times now, 28 years. And uh, so it's it's current right now. Now there could be a few mistakes. We're dealing with a lot of a lot of pages. So we have uh, let's see, 18 pages of breeders and 21 pages of sires. I'm not going to show all those tonight. And of that, there's five pages of breeders with just one win, and there's six pages of breeders with one win, of sires with one win. I apologize. Five with breeders and six pages of just one win for each sire so that's a lot of information there's a lot of zeros and ones in there pages and pages of it so you know once i've i've kept double checking it i triple check it you know i read it over and over every year to make sure there's no mistakes so sometimes i catch stuff it might be a mistake in the stud book too or something like that i'm not blaming anybody that's another thing i want to bring up tonight before i start showing all these people's names and all these stallions names i want to keep this positive I don't want any uh, negative comments like, oh, I can't believe that person only raised that many or that stallion didn't do that or whatever. We don't want to talk about that. I can't, we just want to, it's an honor to be on these lists. If you bred for one champion, great, that's a good job. If a stallion you bred or owned had one champion, great. Some people raised 100, you know, wins or horses that won 100 classes. Uh, but if it was just one, hey, that's great too. So I compare it to like uh, singers or music groups that had a hit and they call them a one hit wonder. Well, you know what? At least they had a hit, right? Well, that's just like a breeder. There's been thousands and thousands of breeders. So the fact that there's about 785 estimated breeders that are on this list and there's about 914 sires. Now, I haven't went lately and counted every single one, but I just count the pages and multiply that. I know how many is on each page. So uh, anyway, let's get to these lists. It's going to be pretty interesting. My uh, production manager here, he's the owner of Jackson's, the general manager, Shane Jackson. He was laughing because I always send the pictures to him, and then this is his setup. This is his studio that I named Studio J, and he's seen all these pages and no pictures. He goes, this looks like the most boring podcast ever. And I said, well, if you're into POA history and statistics, then it's not. Then you'd enjoy it. But, yeah, it's not as pretty as a bunch of colored ponies like I usually show and a bunch of kids and people showing them. So, anyway, we're going to get to the pages here. And this is the first page. So, now, some more rules. I just wanted to put this up, and I kind of tease people today. I put this on uh, Facebook so you could kind of look at it. Uh, again, the first column, of course, the name and the numbers. Now, the first page is numbered. The top 40 are on the first page. So only the first 40 people. Sometimes it might be 41, but this year it is. It ends at 40. And uh, then it goes on now. The second page doesn't have numbers. I didn't keep numbering it to 100, 200, whatever. That would be maddening. So only the first page gets a number. And you'll hear people like Jeremy St- Stevens or Pat Burton or Jackie or somebody like that mention the first page is so-and-so on the first page or does that stallion made the first page yet and that's what they're talking about the first page of these lists so of course it's the ranking then the name and then the state they're from in the breeders and then the first column there so 25 for steals that's 25.5 that's halter and then uh, the next column's performance and then the last columns are total so right away i know there's going to be a question how do you get a half a win and that's a good question again i was 21 when i did this and i may be do it different now if i had it to do over again but the way i did it is you have the breeders classes so you have mare and foal a lot of times the mare and the foal are not bred by the same person so i would give them a half now in performance they used to have a match pair class where two two kids would dress up and they would have they would show the two poas and there again, it was two. So instead of giving a win a piece, 
I would split it. One positive thing I've come out of that is it's a great tiebreaker. It's, it's a way to bust up ties, especially in the styers list where you see so many names. It really helps separate some. And you can see the top three breeders here all have a 0.5. I used to put half when I typed it, but now using a computer, I just put 0.5. So that's some of the rules there now. When you get, let's say like this year, for example, Kiddo Bounce had three foals standing out there for him and get a sire, just like the other sires that were entered in the class. Kiddo Bounce won the class. Those three foals representing him won the class for him. But the winner of the class is Kiddo Bounce, not the three foals standing out there. And some people get confused by this. But just so that means the person who bred Kiddo Bounce, which is the Kruger family, they get that win. And then the sire of Kiddo Bounce gets the win. It's not that Kiddo Bounce gets that win. Now, if, if it's a halter class and there's a baby wins the weanling fillies or whatever and it's a kiddo bounce, well, then kiddo bounce gets the win and whoever bred the baby gets the win. But in breeders' classes, it's a little more complicated because it's whoever on the piece of paper that actually won the class. Once you see it written down and stuff, you understand a little more. So if anybody has any questions when they, we start going through these lists or believe you see mistakes, a lot of times it's misunderstandings. I've had people come up to me and say, well, my daughter won seven classes one year and you don't have that horse's sire down. I know who it was and or you only have it for two. And then we start talking and they'll mention the town that a national show hasn't even been in. And it might have been a world show or it was a regional show, a huge regional. And so people get confused sometimes on that. It's only the international show and now what turned into the National Congress. High points don't count, things like that. So uh, that's some of the rules there. I think I explained most of the stuff. Now I mentioned that uh, Gene Adams and Ruth Picoy helped me out a lot. And of course, Aaron Jewell, because I got the magazines from him this year, my uh, garage is kind of disarray. I couldn't find one of my stud books, and then I don't have the last couple. So I contacted Dave Morris. He's a fellow historian. He's got a great setup down at his house in Edmond. And uh, my wife and I spent the weekend for the 4th of July down south of Edmond uh, in southern Oklahoma. So on the way back, we swung into um, Dave's place, spent an afternoon with him Sunday. It was a great time. My dad had been at Morris's several times, but I'd never been there. So I got to see uh, some of the ponies he still has. He has a grand champion stallion, uh, 2D's Cusa Rio, was 2011 grand champion stallion. And uh, I got to see his little library there. It's a cool setup. And I went through, I used his stud books Why uh, the three of us, my wife, Monica, and Dave and I sat at his kitchen table and talked about a bunch of different things. And I got to update my list. So that's how close I cut this. I was doing that Sunday, and then Sunday night and Monday night, I've stayed up uh, updating this. So that brings me to another thing when we get to on these lists is if a horse wins its class, let's just say a two-year-old colt, for instance, wins its class. That's one win. If it's the junior champion, that's another win. If it goes on to be a grand champion, that's another win. So a grand champion each year gets three wins. And you'll see some of these stallions that have three wins or six wins in halter. You know they had a, a horse that won twice, won grand twice, and maybe never won nothing else, and another full maybe didn't win. Uh, so that's the wins they get. Now, if they go win their class and win reserve junior or reserve senior or reserve grand, there's nothing for the reserves. You don't get a point or anything like that. So you have to win grand. So a lot of times now you have youth, and you have now that's new classes and you have most colorful so a halter horse could pick up about five wins technically so if with the youth classes now so that's another thing uh, every time i say something it leads me to something that's changed you have to remember there's a lot more classes now uh when the poa shows so i should have included uh, a show bill from some of the early day classes or shows but there's way more classes than there was even 10 years ago they've added a lot of lead-in classes and stuff which is awesome let more people in 45 and over and all that i count those classes like i say i just don't count some of the futurities and stuff like that and again if you have opinions about certain stuff like that uh, you can uh, let me know off there you can text me email me uh, send me a private message on facebook uh, whatever you want to do 
So, uh, and then another thing, when it comes to balance, a lot of times people will see like if somebody has 20 wins as a breeder in halter and 20 wins in performance, they'll say that's balance. Well, actually, you should have more wins in performance than halter because there's way more chances to get wins in performance. And what I've kind of figured out, I mean, I didn't hire a mathematician or a scientist to figure this out, but it's kind of four times is what it is. So if you have 20 halter wins, to be really good balance, you should have about 80 performance wins. Now, of course, some people judge confirmation a lot more and they bring, and you can show your babies some people show their babies and then sell them and they show their yearlings and two-year-olds and put on wins theirself and then their numbers are going to be a little more skewed they're going to maybe have more halter wins than performance wins because you know they showed and they helped their self out a lot so here we go i haven't had a comment in a while so i hope everything's going i don't see tracy on here i hope she i guess she didn't get on she would have said hi so I do see Mark and Terry, and uh, I don't know who said awesome. It's also awesome. I don't know who said that. But uh, anyway, here we go. Barb, there's Barb. She said that makes sense. I'm glad you understand that. So I don't have a highlight or anything because this is like a slideshow. So uh, you're just going to have to follow me along. Hopefully you've been looking at this as I've been rambling on. But, of course, Ken Steele is the leading breeder, KS's Pony Farm. There again, they had a lot of performance POIs, uh, but they also did pretty good in halter. 25.5 is very good numbers for halter. And uh, they're the only breeder over 208 wins. So over 200 wins, I mean, they have 208 and a half. So when I started this, as I've said before, Lynn Puffenberger was the number one breeder, and he was for a long time, a couple decades course he's number three now you see 47 uh, wins you know he had six grands and six decades so right there is 18 wins three times six is 18 so he had a lot of halter wins but his salty stuff was known for performance uh, Lynn got passed by Gene Carr who is now number two Gene was number one for a little while before Ken Steele got him and you got to remember this is like a game to me growing up watching this I mean my whole adult life has been with these lists. So when we get to the sires, a lot of the sires weren't even born yet when I started this list. Some of the top sires, there's three of them in the top 10. And I kind of tease that on Facebook and we'll talk about that. But uh, some of these names, once we get to half the first page, I ain't gonna be able to have time to talk about every single breeder. And I apologize, but again, if anybody ever uh, wants to know more you can contact me and keep in mind these lists are copyrighted they're copyrighted from 1993 and they've been copyrighted many times since so please don't uh recopy them if you need a copy for some reason you can contact me hopefully we get it on the poa website uh, or maybe even the year-end magazine that uh, tammy verzi does such a good job with that's a, a cool year-end book. So, uh, but And these have been approved. It's been a while, but they were approved by the POAC National Board of Directors as being approved by POAC. So, uh, okay, so the top three, again, Steel, Carr, and Puffenbarger. They all had good-looking POAs. You can tell the 25, 96, and 47 numbers in Halter, but they all did good in performance, too. And, and then, of course, uh, number four is Dean Damon. I just seen Corey. Make a comment. Yep, I can see you, Corey. Uh, that's three generations of the Damons, Dean's mom, and then, of course, his son, Corey's breeding now. And uh, they've uh, there's a name right there that I've watched come up this list. When I started these lists in 93, they had some halter wins and a few performance wins, not many. So almost all their 113 performance wins has happened uh, since 93. Of course, Dean's bred uh, grand champions, all three grand champions. Uh, and he's had a couple mares, and uh, of course he's had some futurity winners, but that doesn't count on here. The select sire has nothing to do with this list. So uh, Puffenbergers, or, or I mean uh, Damons, have shot up all the way to fourth. Last year they were in fifth, so they jumped one this year because they got a bunch of wins now. The Silver Kid has helped them a lot. You know, he's still he's the number one sire. We'll get to him. Uh, Pat Patrick sitting in number five right now. She, uh, 144 is a lot of wins. You see those top five there, and then there's a little drop-off to the next one, a drop-off of 
uh, 30 wins. So that's a big cliff there. So your top five, that's kind of unique how they're separated a little bit. And Steele starting to separate himself, even KS's, how they're going ahead. You know, they're over 20 ahead of the next, of second place. So, of course, Pat's, Pat Patrick's the Suncrest POAs. We had a whole episode about her POAs. She's had quite a few grand champions. Uh, a Suncrest Uncle Sam won a lot of these in performance. And then, of course, Miss Tattletail and Big Max won. And uh, there again, for the versatility now, this is just how I've done it. I count the classes, but I don't count the overall winner of the versatility, but I count each class. Again, that's just how I've done it. As I feel as long as I stay consistent and stay to the rules I've set for this, that it's, you know, it's very, fairly accurate. So um, now Julian Nemers, Doc Nemers, he's uh, in sixth place. He just moved into sixth this year. Again, Doc has had a lot of success in POAs, have sold a lot of high sellers and had futurity winners and stuff. His name wasn't always that high on this list. He's climbed over the years. He had halter success, but his performance numbers wasn't as high. That's starting to change a little bit now. Of course, Doc's introduced some of the great bloodlines into POAs. He was the first person to breed to chocolatey. He's been the first person to breed to a lot of stallions. Some of them didn't have success. Some of them had great success. Uh, chocolatey, of course, look at everyone that's bred to him, and we're going to see his name on the leading sires list. Uh, pretty high. So Doc sitting in sixth place, 55 halter wins is outstanding. I believe that's second to Gene Carr. Uh, so you a lot of halter wins, 114 total. So congratulations to Doc for moving into sixth. He passed the Katzenberger family, who was again three or now four generations of people showing POAs. The Katzenbergers have won quite a few of these classes on their own for their self. And then, of course, a lot of the performance classes has been by other people, too. Um, they didn't pick up any wins this year, so they stayed at 108 and a half. So they remained in seventh place. Or in, they went down to seventh place. They were in sixth place. So now Dean and Jan Rogers, for years, Dean and Jan and us, Rourke's, were right next to each other. They'd either be one ahead of us or one behind us. For years, it happened that way, for 10 years or so. And then they fell down to about 11th place, as low as they got. And this year, they had about four different POAs win. Some of them are by Gold Matrix. And they jumped from 11th place all the way up to 8th place. They had a big show in uh, 2020. And so now they're ranked 8th with 35 um, in halter and 73 in performance for a total of 108. So they're just a half behind the Katzenbergers. And then right behind them now is Tide. That's my family, Rourke's POAs. Pat and Erlene was my uh, mom and dad. And then my brothers bred some, Kirk and his family, Kirk and Monica. And then, of course, I bred some as an adult too. So uh, we're now in ninth. The highest we ever been was seventh. I don't believe we hit six. We climbed up to seventh and... Uh, Damons have passed us, Katzenbergers, and Nemers. They have all passed us. So I believe at one time it was the same, four of the same five that are up there now. And then, of course, Victors and Pete's were ahead of us for quite a year, quite a few years. So uh, Wanda picked up a win this year. There was a plotted source that won by Texas T's Ferrari. And uh, so that's, she's tied for ninth now, her and Howard. Of course, Howard passed away a long time ago, and Wanda continued to breed uh, before she passed away. But uh, she has 102 wins now. So, and there's balance I'm talking about right there. Like, uh, for Rourke's POAs, I wish we had a few more halter wins. We're at 11 and 91. Uh, the Crisco kid won a lot of classes for us, but if you took him away, we would still be almost on the first page, I believe. So and you can't really penalize somebody for a horse that won that many classes. If you took the number one away from every breeder, they'd be missing a lot of wins. So, But the victors had a lot of plotted horses over the years that won classes. And um, so looking at their numbers, 21 and 81, to me, that's almost about a perfect balance. And they're at 102. The last person to round out uh, 100 wins, and he just slipped down out of the top 10 for the first time, I think, ever. I think ever since these lists have been made, Ray Peets from Iowa was in the top 10. This year, uh, he got bumped out, and that's because uh, Rogers jumped over him. 
Uh, but anyway, he's still in 11th place, 17 and 83. He's the Driftwoods POAs, and then he had Aztecs for a while. He also raised some he didn't put a prefix on, uh, like Sugar Bars Dottie and different POAs like that. But he's the last person to have 100 wins. So there's 11 people with 100 wins in the Breeders. When you go to 12th now, this is a success story that started in 1989, John and Bunny Kennedy. Of course, John passed away some years ago, and then Bunny kept breeding in the Kennedy Family Trust, and everybody will know their POAs as the PAL POAs. Uh, here's another thing I've run across. You know, they bred most of their champions in Texas, and then or in Nebraska, I'm sorry, Nebraska, and then she moved to Texas. Well, what I would do on these lists is just like Doc Nemers bred a lot of his uh, POAs in Iowa, Dubuque, Iowa, and then he moved to Wisconsin. Well, I just kept him as Iowa until he bred for a winner in Wisconsin. Then I changed it on here, and I the same way with Bunny. As soon as one of the pals that were was born in Texas, won a class, I changed it to Texas. So you're going to run across that. That's on here quite a few times where breeders have actually moved states. They either got married or they might have got a divorce or something happened or they just up and changed states. And uh, so sometimes you'll see stuff like that. So that's the Pal Ponies in 12th. They have 96. They're knocking on the door. She picked up two wins this year. Or I keep saying, when I say this year, I mean 2020, the last year, the last show that happened. So, of course, these numbers are going to change here next week. That's why we're talking about this tonight and showing everybody these statistics. So uh, some of these breeders will go up, of course. Most of them did this year in the top that's on this first page, probably about half of them. Uh, so she'll probably reach 100 wins eventually. She's not breeding anymore, but she's got POAs like Pal Just the Gigolos, the one that won two classes in 2020. So that takes us to a longtime breeder in 13th place, Art and Rocky Jones from Oklahoma, bred for a long time. And then their daughter, Jan Jones Nolan, continues to breed. She continues to show. Of course, she raised her kids in POAs. Uh, they currently have 16 halter wins and 78 performance wins for a total of 94 i believe they will probably reach 102 uh, they might have enough out there showing now to do it and then like i say she's still breeding another family that's continuing to move up they jumped a bunch again this year and this is a multi-group family this is the krugers from minnesota bev and gordon had uh, bear creek poas they raised their three kids in poas Teresa became a successful judge marcy is still in the equine industry and she raised quite a few champions she was marcy merrill for a long time and uh, she lived in wisconsin and texas and then of course danielle is the young one of the family she's about my age and she's raising pois now so you put that all together i included marcy in their group a few years ago because she did move back towards home uh, I'm not sure if I should have did that or not, but I think they didn't mind. Uh, so they have 89 breeder uh, wins together, 89 and a half. So six and a half in halter, 83 in performance. Of course, they use Kiddo Tough for quite a while, and they bred some other stuff. They, of course, Black Swan S was their famous show mare, and Marcy had Tough Contender was her show mare, and that she raised uh, quite a few wins by her auto. Okay, number 15 is Hank Frieder. Hank Frieder was a great person. He uh, was a board of directors, knew a lot about bits and a lot about the horse industry. And uh, he only had a few horses, a few POAs that actually won classes. He didn't raise that many POAs. Uh, but HMH, Super Sox, of course, McKenzie's outstanding, all everything mare. Maybe arguably one of the greatest or the greatest mare ever born, possibly in POAs. She was bred by Hank Frieder. She's the majority of these wins in the 80 tile over there in the 80 section. Uh, there's been a few other HMH. There was HMH, Color Me Bright, and a, a few others like that. Uh, so she didn't get all 80 wins, but I'm guessing she's probably in the 60s or 70s. I don't have it broke up separate. That's another thing I wish I would have did over time. I wish I would have kept individual results, but it's just a lot of numbers. Another thing people's asked me, why didn't you do dams? Well, there'd be so many pages of dams. And you know, when I first started this, uh, these lists, I didn't even have them alphabetized. So talk about a cluster, you know, and just trying to keep track of everything. So if anybody wants to make any comments, like I say, just keep it positive. 
Uh, I haven't seen anybody comment since Corey asked if I could see him, which I can. Uh, so that's Hank Frieder. And like I say, he deserves to be on this list because he bred for uh, that great mare. And then he bred for some others that won too. And uh, the next one is, that's the Dutch POAs. That's Ann Dykstra from Iowa. And of course, they were hot and heavy for a while there. They bought a lot of mares and they went and out and bought some good mares. They had a good eye for uh, a good horse, Kevin and Ann Dykstra. And the Dutch POAs became very popular. They were very good at marketing their stuff and it was good stuff. So uh, their horses have won 73 performance classes and 81 toll. And uh, they picked up a few wins in uh, 2020 as well. And uh, they may actually climb up to get 100 wins too because they have a lot of Dutch ponies out there. Of course, Dutch Daytona, Daytona won quite a few. And uh, they used RY Major Equity for a while and they bred to First Impulse and had some sons of his and stuff. Now they have a chocolatey son or they did have. Uh, but like I say, there for a while, they were raising 20 some foals a year and they got them into some good hands. Uh, that's a big part of this is getting them into show families and good hands. You know, we need POAs for ranch riding and trail riding and all that. Uh, we need POAs all over. We need them to go to other countries even. But for the purpose of this list, if you can get them into fam families that would go to the national show, you're going to look better here. So that's just, you know, that's how it is. Um, so, okay, that's 16. That's the Dykstra's Dutch. So 17 is a longtime friend of mine. She helped me out a lot in POAs, basically a mentor to me. And that's Jackie Blazer. And now she's Jackie Guthrie. So the Blazers uh, raised some POAs and a lot of POAs in Wisconsin. And then uh, she remarried and became married Larry Guthrie, became Jackie Guthrie. Of course, she's uh, raised a lot of POAs. She's had a lot of famous stallions over the years. She stood St. Nick Stowe Storm before that, JBJ's Totally Macho. Uh, but her and the Krugers bought Kiddo Tough, and she did well with Kiddo Tough. And now lately, what's really popped her up on this list, of course, is the success she's had with Kiddo Bounce. And she's bred Kiddo Bounce to some great horse mares that she's handpicked over the years. And she's built up some good herds over time. And some other people have come and got those herds for her once in a while. Uh, but the JBJs, of course, is her prefix. The grand champion, current grand champion, last two years in a row has been bred by Jackie. Uh, Jackie has great people like Tammy Verzi and people like that that show her stuff. Jackie's shown a lot of her own. And, of course, in performance, people go do well. The kiddo bounce is a lot of her performance wins, and we'll see his name here. She's had him for a little over 10 years and rejuvenated his career as a sire. And uh, she's, she's up there at 74 and a half now. I remember when Jackie had probably under 20 wins when I started this list. So she's, uh, she's come a long way and, uh, she's, I, you know, sky's the limit. She's, she's going to keep going because she has a lot of POAs. Now keep in mind, there might be a mare bred right now that has a baby for any of these breeders or somebody that's not even on this list that has a baby born in 2022, that 20 years from now, God willing, everything goes well. The class is still, the show's still around and the POA breed's still around. Goes out and wins five or six game classes. Or 10 years from now, wins Western Pleasure 14 through 18 or whatever it'll be called then. It used to be 13 through 18. So, you know what I mean? It's a horse that ain't even born now could win a bunch of classes down the road. And some of it'll be for breeders like this. And some of it will be for people that haven't bred one yet. So we move to number 18 and that's Ken Bateman. Ken Bateman had the Ken Wills in Colorado, a lot of great Ken Wills. They were big promoters, pushed their POAs real hard and, and well. They did great. Steve was their son that showed uh, some good Appaloosas and POAs, and that was Ken and Wilma Bateman. That's how you get Ken Wills. Of course, they had Barkeeper from George Bishop, and that helped them a lot. And then, uh, you know, Ken and Wilma went their separate ways. Ken ended up moving to Idaho and he married Jackie. So Ken and Jackie Bateman bred POAs for years in Idaho, and that was the JKB. So you're, here you have a gentleman with two famous prefixes, one a little more famous than the other, but the Ken Wills and the JKB. There was a JKB that won in 2020, still won. So and there could be, again, for a few years, JKB is winning. So you put those two programs of his together, and you ended up with 70 wins. 
So that's a pretty good accomplishment there. And he did it in two different states, Colorado and Idaho. So if you showed this list to somebody that has passed away years and years ago, like Keystone or somebody like that, they'd say, wait a minute, you have a mistake. Ken Bateman lived in Colorado. Well, that's because the modern history of the last 20, 30 years or so, he did move to Idaho and he raised quite a few POAs in Idaho that did win. So we move on to 19. When I started these lists, the number one halter breeder for POAs was the Murfeld family from Iowa. And, of course, Ed Murfeld, Ed and Audrey, and their sons, uh, E. Allen, and, of course, Doug. Doug Murfeld's in the Hall of Fame, I believe. If he's not, he should be. Uh, I'm sure he is. Ed, I nominated Ed years after he should have been. He should have been one of the top four or five gentlemen in the Hall of Fame, and he is in there now. Uh, but MPs is their prefix, and they showed a lot of their own. Doug uh, showed a lot of their babies and uh, stock and won classes. So 39 halter wins at one time was number one because they haven't gained any halter wins in a long time. They stopped breeding. Doug did. Doug and Tracy, uh, his wife, did raise a few down when they moved back from Dakota to Iowa, and uh, he raised a few performance wins. Uh, MPs, I think Fly with the Leader was one of his. Uh, by Fly the Gold of DeBurs. Uh, but anyway, that shows you how these lists have progressed. If you look up from number 19 there, you see now Jackie has passed 39, Halter wins, and then Rogers is almost there at 35. Nemers has passed it at 55. Damon's at 40. Puffenberger, 47. Carr at 96 and a half. And, of course, Steele. Well, Steele hasn't passed 39. So some... You know, they're still in the top 10 for halter wins, but uh, 28 years ago, they were number one. Uh, so then we go to a little program here that's created a lot of wins, and that's Evie Thomas and her daughter, Kim Belford. And most of this is because of the Silver Kid. Uh, they had uh, some coal miner sparkles mares, I believe, and I think they only bred one or two mares a year, uh, but you'd recognize a lot of the, the CN like uh, the horse they call Patrick, he's CN Silver Leprechaun, and anything CN Silver basically came from them. And Patrick's is their lone halter win. I remember the day he won halter because I was laughing. I was the only one probably laughing in the stands, but not because it was funny that he won, but I knew the Silver Kid was all performance at the time. That was uh, his, first perform his first halter win, and it still is uh, Kim and Evie's only halter win. But look at that, 61 performance wins. That's outstanding. And they're tied with the Murfelds for 62 wins. The Arbuckles, uh, 3 and 58. 54 of those wins came from one POA. I wish Tracy was on here. I know Jeremy Stevens is uh, at a party tonight, so he couldn't be here live. But I know they would know who it is. Uh, but it's a Kansas POA, and that's the famous Shoto. Shoto that was owned by the Denny family won 54 performance classes so that's a big hunk of uh, Arbuckle 61 of course that's BB Arbuckle from Kansas uh, I talked about number 22 the last couple weeks on the salty uh, shows and that's L Nelson I believe L stood for Lynn but I don't even know if Lynn has seen many uh, that L Nelson seen many POAs it was he was just a a resident of Cherokee, and Lynn Puffenberger went and, get, went and got one of his grade mares that was named Toots. She was basically like a grade quarter horse, I believe. He bred her to Salty Three Bars, and after Salty Three Bars passed away in 83, in 84, out came Tudor Bars, another outstanding gilding. And what's so ironic about these lists are you see these little things to me. They're little games, little fun things. You know, there's... Uh, Shoto with 54 wins representing our buckles and then Nelson has 59 wins and that's all one POA. He technically never read a POA. Lynn should have really got the credit for that, but he never got it changed in the stud books officially, so I couldn't do it here. I mean, that would look like favoritism. So uh, Tudor Bars is those 59 wins, and he broke Shoto's record of 54. Uh, and then later... Tudor Bar's record was broke by the Crisco Kid, who won 60, but two of those were done in performance, or in halter, I mean. Two of 
Chris goes was in halter and 58 was in performance. Now I do believe the Super Sox mare McKenzie's has probably broke that, but that's unofficial because I can't prove it. I need to go back one of these days and just dig up her wins and uh, see how many she's got, but I'm pretty sure she's probably over 60. Her and Elena won uh, a lot of classes together, and so did uh, uh, the McKenzie girls, uh, Allison, but Elena won most of them. So there we go on to after Nelson is a great name in POAs. If you heard of the Cayuga POAs, that's from George and Pat Lalonde. They bred POAs in Texas. And then when Les Boomhauer retired as the executive secretary, they moved George Lalonde from Texas to Iowa, and he kept breeding POAs in, um, near Mason City, and he became the executive secretary for 10 years. And uh, that really helped POAs in the 70s. That was kind of one of the golden eras of POAs. And uh, their Cayuga's POAs won quite a bit. They had a grand champion mare, I believe it was in 72, Cayuga's Red Wing. Of course, a lot of famous Cayuga's POAs. We talked about spider britches last week that the Puffenbergers had by their chief little britches stallion. So 58 and a half uh, wins there. And uh, then we go to a newer family as far as, you know, they've been in POAs probably 40 years, but the Chestnuts, that's Harry Chestnut and his kids and his wife, and they're from Michigan. Of course, uh, they bred, they used some Santee POAs early on, and they continued to do that. And then they got into the invitation breeding, black tie invitation and some of those, and that's really changed their program and helped them in uh, performance and they put out some nice POAs and uh, they went all the way up to 58 uh, wins as a breeder. Tied with them is another famous name in POAs that hasn't bred POAs since about the time Chestnuts probably got into POAs or maybe four or five years before that and that's Quincy Rutledge from Texas. Quincy had a large operation in Texas and I think he probably had cattle and uh, he raised some POAs just kind of on the range there. And uh, Rut Rut Rutledge's Yoka Chigger Pep became a famous POA. Of course, you had Rutledge's Yoka and Rutledge's Oscar because some of the stallions he had. Uh, but Chigger Pep won a lot of these in performance. And But he had other Rutledge's too. Like I said, Yoka D, and there's been several mares. He had Chigger Pep and Chigger B because of the quarter horses he had across those little stallions. And uh, he just produced some good-looking POAs and really rugged, durable POAs. And uh, he's got a lot of halter wins and performance wins for uh, 58. So that takes us to number 26, which is Leonard Lewis. Leonard and Joan Lewis raised their three kids into POAs and POAs, and then they raised their grandson, Jeremy Poitra, into POAs. He had a great career. And, of course, they are the breeders of Tough Plotted and Gold Chips, of course, Tough Plot it never won anything uh, as a su – well, yeah, he won grand as a, in 86, so he was three wins for him in halter. And, but, you know, he went on more to become a famous sire. And uh, Gold Chips was kind of the opposite. He didn't become as famous sire as Tough Plot it, uh, but he won, you know, as a yearling, and then he won grand as a two-year-old. So that's some of their wins there. Of course, Leonard picked up quite a few of these 22-and-a-half wins himself with the foals by – Miss Hydeck, Double Deck alone, one as a baby, yearling, two-year-old, and three-year-old, one her halter class. Uh, that's a feat that hasn't been duplicated uh, four years in a row starting as a baby. And they have uh, 134. Their granddaughter, Andrea Schwab, uh, Bonnie's daughter, won a lot of those classes uh, because she showed Crash and Burn, a homebred, and then uh, the Sudley mare they had, uh, I think all of a sudden was her name. Uh, but anyway, they've they got 56 and a half wins. So another uh, name on here, more modern. Of course, he grew up in POAs, basically. He was a kid when his dad had POAs in Kansas. That's Pat Burton. Uh, he's bred his champions in Texas. He continues to breed. Uh, he's got quite a few mares. His uh, wife, Janelle, is also on this list uh, because she's bred quite a few uh, grand champions now, too. And uh, so she's on here. It kind of makes it complicated. I always joke with Pat. I said, you can't marry into wins, so you can't inherit Janelle's wins. So hopefully they find that funny. Uh, but Pat himself has 54 wins. Of course, Pat's uh, the greatest showman and halter uh, of POA history. You know, he does a great job 
uh, presenting those POAs out there, and he's done a good job uh, breeding POAs. He had Chip and Putt, and, of course, the realist was a son of Impressive out of a Zippo Pat Bar's daughter. Uh, he was a corridor stay, and he raised some good POAs out of him. So number 28 is an older name there. That's the Salty or Sant, oh, just a minute, St. Nick's. Apologize, the St. Nick's gentleman, and that's George Bishop. He was one of the best promoters of POAs. He ended up being the breeder, a barkeeper, and, of course, Salty Three Bars, and then all the St. Nick's, most of the St. Nick's. So when I created these lists, it seemed like forever we were b behind Bishop and Arbuckle, Bishop and Bateman were tied or close. They were right next to each other for years, over 10 years. They were just like 15 and 16 or, you know, 7 and 8 or whatever they were. They were just near each other. And a lot of these names have come up now in past Bishop, including Burton, Lewis, the Chestnuts, of course, Thomas and Belford, Jackie, the Dykstras, Frieder, a lot of these guys, Kennedys and us, uh, they've come up and, and passed him. So he's pushed down all the way to 28th. Uh, but he was just one of those names along with Lalonde and Rutledge that I remember dad said, I don't know if we're ever going to get by these guys. And they were all sitting in that 50 range. Uh, so uh, that's where they are now. And then he's tied with Marlene Borjan. Marlene Borjan bred in Iowa. Of course, she had uh, Hive Avatar that she used. And uh, before that, she was the breeder of High Plains Drifter. He won quite a few halter classes and won. He was the first grand champion stallion as a yearling and that was in 1981 when he won and she's the breeder of him and his full sister tough sorrel sunday which tracy's family owned for a while uh, so marlene had a good eye for a poa and she has 50 wins tied with bishop the astons from georgia now this is another success story they did all this with just a couple mares they've never probably had more than two foals a year uh, but they've been breeding for quite a while now I can remember in, when they got their first win, they would probably know when it was, but it was in the 2000s, I would say, early 2000s. So from going to from 0 to 49 in that quick a time, that's one of the fastest jumps on this list. Of course, they're the breeder of Speaker of the House, and they've bred for their, their mare, KS's Boogie with the Ghost, is a mare that's really helped put them on the list. Of course, she also had Cappuccino, I believe was her name, uh, but two mares pretty much over the years is what's helped put them uh, up here. They did use a corridor stallion named Leo's Gold Peppy, and you'll see him on the sires list. They help help make him a well-known name just by breeding to him alone. And uh, so uh, that's where they're, they're ranked. They're number 30. And then you have Dave Morris, who, again, I know he's watching tonight. I was at Dave's house Sunday. Uh, his stud books helped me finish this this year. And uh, he started out breeding in 1967 in Minnesota, him and his brother. And that's where you get the two Ds. That's his prefix. And uh, he still has his stallion there and a couple mares. He raises a couple uh, cute babies every year. But he just hasn't been pushing uh, that much lately. But, of course, his family, uh, Bonnie and their daughter Susie and then Tommy, uh, their son Tommy, they all showed POAs and did well. Tommy had a good show career. And... Uh, his 2D POAs have won 47 classes. So another name that's come up a lot the last couple years, probably the last 10 years or so, and they've helped change POAs tremendously, especially in the pleasure industry of POAs, and that's Leo and Leanne. Now, I always say Hawk. I'm sorry if I mispronounce her name, Hack or Hawk. I always say Hawk. Uh, I've been on their place. I was on the board of directors with Leanne. Uh, great breeders, of course. Um, Impulse, you know, they bred for First Impulse and then promoted First Impulse, and a lot of people went and bred, and a lot of people kind of like Gold Prince 20 years before, everybody tried to recreate First Impulse. You know, there was the Sudden Impulse, the Appaloosa. Uh, Dean Rogers had a court horse son the same age named a Sudden uh, Zippo, and then there was suddenly... An imp or uh, what's the sudden impulse? Uh, let's see. Suddenly a sunny. Suddenly a sunny. He's been used. So there's been quite a few sons, but the original POA was bred by Leo and Leanne. The original impulse, and that was first impulse. And we'll see him very high on the list here. 
Uh, let's see, it's almost 7.30, so I'm going to start speeding up a little bit. But they have 46 wins, and a lot of that is because of, of first impulse. And, of course, Leo likes to show, and he's a good showman himself, and uh, he's done well in showing his uh, yearlings and stuff like that. So that helps them with wins as well. Uh, in 33rd, we kind of have a log jam here, and that's been a long time It's uh, that it's been like this. Linda Schoenfeld. The Sharping Brothers and Olin Ziegler are all tied in 33rd with 45 and a half wins. And I mean, that's almost a, a blockade there for people to get by, it seems like, if you want to think of it that way. Now, of course, Linda Schoenfeld bred for a few POAs, uh, but the main one was Darlin Jill that did a lot of winning for her. Her sister's family, Judy Katzenberger, uh, had Darlin Jill and made her famous and, of course, used her raised a bunch of babies out of her. We talked about that in episode three. So that's a lot of her wins, but she's had other POAs that won too. The Sharping Brothers, uh, they're mainly here because of Black Swan S, uh, but I'll show you her sire, Krogue Star, in a minute. So we'll see exactly how many she won. So they also bred Jimmy and Johnny Charm. Johnny Charm was a grand champion, I think in 1972, grand champion gilding. Uh, so they bred quite a few. They were out in uh, South Dakota. They were kind of removed from POAs. They didn't get into the politics or anything, but people like Carl Oz and Ray Peets, Bud Campbell, Max Nebergall, they would all go out and get some of their young stock. And uh, they also bred Cricket McHugh, uh, who was an Appaloosa and hardshipped as a POA by Carl Oz. So they're the breeder of two grand champion mares, uh, Black Swan S and Cricket McHugh, both beautiful, famous POA mares. And then they're also the breeder of Johnny Charm, a grand champion uh, gilding. So that's some of their 15 halter ones right there. Of course, Olin and Patsy Ziegler had Oz's POA farm in Ohio. They lived in two different towns in Ohio. Uh, they showed a lot of their own POAs and did well. Uh, of course, they also bred like the Baron and some other POAs. They dropped their prefix for a while in the early 80s and then brought it back right before uh, they got out of POAs, about 88 or so. Uh, they bred for Tough Jet, a grand champion. Of course, Oz's Minute Maid is a grand champion uh, bred by them. She ended up being the grand dam to Kenwell's barmaid. So they're in that group with 45 and a half wins. So that takes us to number 36, and I have to get a drink of water. I hope everybody's enjoying the show. Stay tuned because after the breeders list, <laughs> we're going to talk about the sires list. So I got to use my sound effects. So the 30s is really jumbled up because we have those three at 33. So then that goes 34, 35. Basically, the Bagwells are at 36. That's Sue Bagwell. Of course, they're River Bend Ranch from Tulsa. This is a great success story, a cool POA story. They came to the Tulsa State Fair, seen JK or JKA Supreme Scooter, fell in love with him, purchased him. The rest is history. Uh, almost all of these are related to him. Well, they all are. Um, and they bred, they raised some halter champions and they had some people like Darren Vincent and stuff show for them. And so they bred for some grand champions. They know a stallion for sure. And who became a great gilding as well and won some of these. And they just kind of produced what I refer to as those iron POAs, you know, some of those babes with little blankets that just go around and they're there every year and they do a great job. And, uh, that's, that's a lot of their 37 performance wins there. And J.K. Supreme Scooter, they bred him to some quarter mares. They also bred him to some select POA mares that they purchased. And uh, 44 wins, and they're still basically going up. Uh, um, J.K., uh, let's see, RBR Willie Boy, I believe, is uh, won some stuff this year. So anyway, or, and then I'm trying to think of another one. Of, they had another sire that they raised. And, of course, the buns, I need to mention that. They're the breeder of most of the buns. I've had a few people ask of where they came from. Usually buns is tied in with the RBR. Again, RBR stands for River Bend Ranch in uh, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. So tied with them is number 36. That's Melissa Slayton. She now lives in Texas, but I believe, I don't know if she's bred for anything in Texas. That's one, she's kind of switched gears, and she's uh, getting to be a well-known uh, quarter horse 
racing person now, and she also has a little uh, rodeo stock there, contractor. Uh, so she's done quite well. She grew up in POAs, of course. Now she's the breeder of RPR's uh, Impulsive Superman, who's making a name for himself. She's also the breeder of his sire, 2Ds, uh, 2 MDs, 2 Eyed Rawhide. So she's bred for some good POAs. Uh, Superman's a lot of these performance wins. Jess Drish has done a great job getting him to the national show. So uh, Melissa's tied there with the Bagwells with 44 wins. Uh, 38 is a current active breeder, of course, and they have a long uh, historic uh, POA career. That's Spencer's from Oklahoma. Of course, Dave Spencer was in POAs as a kid, and uh, him and his wife raised their three daughters in POAs, and they've all went on. Their kids are showing. And, of course, Rosalind is still uh, continuing the breeding and uh, raising some great POAs. She's collected some good mares and doing some cool things with embryos and stuff. And uh, their, their horse, they don't really use a... a prefix but they had a pal stallion and then they have their appaloosa stallion uh lb all the rage i believe or i might have screwed up that name but i know rage is in there and then of course outrageous cajun is one of their stallions so they're doing a good job they've produced a lot of uh a good POAs. Of course, Lily LaBelle is one of their later ones that's won quite a bit in performance. So they just making the first page there. They jumped up a lot the last three or four years, so they have 42 wins. Again, they're going to continue to climb. They'll go way up in a couple years when you see this list. They'll be well up there, higher than they are now. So that brings us to the last two on the first page, tied at 39. So it rounds out the top 40. That's uh, Joan Franklin and Sarah Atkins, mother and daughter. Of course, Sarah bred uh, to the Silver Kid and got some great performance winners. And then, of course, the Franklins, Brett, they had stuff by Ladies Warrior and stuff back when Sarah was a kid. Sarah and her siblings rode POAs and did a great job. And then Sarah's kids rode POAs. And uh, they sold the High Song Mare the one year at the sale. And uh, they... Together as a family, they have 41 wins as a breeder. So last on the first page is someone that she slipped down a little bit, but again, her husband passed away in the 80s. They had a huge herd, and they had a dispersal sale then. I'm talking about Betty McLaren. And when her husband passed away, they sold a lot of their POAs, but she kept one of their young stallions, and that's Chief Joseph S., and she made a, a breeding career with him. And uh, a lot of these wins happen just with Betty, basically. And, of course, the S ponies. Now, not to be confused by Sharpings would put S on some of them, like Black Swan S. But a lot of people know the S is from Kansas in the, at the end of the name. And uh, that's, again, Chief Joseph S is a sire, a lot of those. And they have 41 wins. Of course, great performance breeders. So that's the first page. I hope everyone's following along well so far we're 7 30 so we're going to move on and now i'm not going to go in you know every single one but i'm going to kind of highlight a little bit and uh hopefully everyone's following along and, and can read this if i look up on the screen there i can't read across very well it's kind of looks staggered because i didn't put dots or anything like that but uh, we're just going to hit this. This is the second page. Again, it's a great honor to be on any of these pages, but the second page is uh, is huge, too. Some of these people have been on the first page and have slipped down. Some just got on this page this year. Uh, Norm Stevenson, of course, is one of the great breeders we lost lately. He didn't promote there for 20, 30 years, but he kept breeding a bunch of POAs. He gave away a lot of foals and stuff like that. He's, he has 39 wins. He's the Dragon Inns guy. Of course, the Latch family was in it forever, Elor Roy Latch and his wife, uh, Helen. And then, of course, Wayne Latch, uh, his kids showed POAs, and uh, he raised horses like uh, Cutie McHugh and Mr. McHugh and stuff like that. So they're up there pretty high. Pennington Jacobs from Michigan, that's the Silver Kid. The .5 isn't, that's before the Silver Kid. That's a POA named Formal Attire that they uh, had by one of their uh, KS's mares. They had some good KS's POAs. Uh, but as breeders, you know, they owned the Silver Kid for quite a while. And most of those 38 wins are from him. And we'll see him on the sires list as he's in the 
number one. Uh, spoiler alert, he's the number one sire of all time on these lists. So, uh, okay, we go the Scheideckers. They're from Wisconsin. They had uh, T.W.'s Firefly was their mainstay mayor. Uh, Eminem Fisher, that's uh, Nancy Fisher and her husband. Uh, they, of course, they've had some good uh, clear run farm, I believe, is theirs. Clear, so CRF. And they bred some grand champions lately. They had uh, Smoky Blackburn early on. And then, of course, they had uh, Impulse bred Appaloosa mare that they bred to Rough and Tough and got some of those halter wins. So Vanderwerk had a Salty God Look foal that won a lot of stuff, pretty much all those. Paula Cooper, again, Paula Cooper is one of the greatest breeders of all time. She's not in the top five or the top ten, but she raised hundreds of POAs. It was in Arizona. She didn't always promote them nationally. Uh, a lot of them was used for breeding because she had the second POA ever. So when she'd produce a POA, especially the stallions, a lot of them just went in to breeding programs. And she's bred for over 20 stallions uh, that have sired at least one win. So that tells you that's quite an accomplishment. A lot of her stuff was used in breeding. So don't let the 36.5 numbers uh, skew you there. Uh, she was a great breeder. And uh, Dinsdale from Iowa. Then we have Mike Gardner. That number is going to keep going up, of course. He's one of the great breeders right now, him and his son Jordan uh, from Utah. They have uh, the RYs, and they keep putting in different bloodlines all the time, uh, adding some quarter horse bloodlines. Of course, they had the great Mare Majors legacy. She kind of became the cornerstone of their program. And then RY Major Equity, of course, they're the breeders of him. Mary Jo McMahon, I want to hit on her a little bit, talk about her because uh, she did all this with one mare. And I believe the mare is still alive. I hope she is. She's an Abdul's grandson, daughter, and her name is Mischievous. And Mary showed her. She won, a, I think, a trail, JPFC trail class or something when she was young. And then she started breeding her to like First Impulse and then Chocolatey and horses like that. And uh, I'm going to miss some of them, but I know she's had at least four or five foals that have won classes on uh, mission mission impossible uh impulsible and then uh, chocolate chastity or chassis chocolate chassis chassis is his name he's one of them sorry when i uh, screw up on these names but and there's been others too but they're all been by one out of one mare and that's mischievous so that's quite a doing there to have 34 wins when you've only ever used uh, one mare uh here we have the myers Non, not related, of course, even though Larry Myers purchased K&K's Monty's Award from Ron and Nancy Meyer in uh, Minnesota. And, of course, they're spelled different. One's Myers and one's Meyer. I think there's five or six at least different forms of Myers on these lists out of almost 800 names. So it's ironic that they're right next to each other, 33 and 32. Of course, some of it is, or 34 and 33, I'm sorry. Some of it is because they used the same stallion for a while, Monty's Award, and uh, he sired some of, a lot of these wins for both of them. Of course, Larry ended up using uh, CR Star Kid, a kiddo tough son. He did well for him. And then uh, Ron Meyer had a daughter, a kiddo tough, uh, that produced quite a few winners for him as well. And she was out of his good little mare, uh, Little Miss Honky Tonk, who was also... A good producer for him so both those guys passed the longtime breeder that was on this list higher up i believe he was on the bottom of the first page a long time ago that's bud and birdie campbell that's the campbell's poas like campbell's dream catcher campbell's mr and mrs kaleida poas like that so and again bud was a flashy showman liked his halter horses he raised some nice appaloosas too uh, he liked prince fury that was a favorite a stallion of his that he did end up using quite a bit in the 80s and uh, so he did like halter and he ended up with 32 wins Marilyn Graff is after that from Michigan she's tied with Bud with 32 that's the Cam's POAs another great breeder uh, Sharon Fellens was a great photographer from Wisconsin she's on the list here now here's something if you look at Pow Wow Pony Farm and then follow me down a couple, skip a few, we'll go back to them, but you see F. Polling. F. Polling stands for Fall, Faller Polling. He was the first president of the POA club, and his place was named Pawa Pony Farm. 
And I'm going to get to this story. And I had a falling out with one of my friends, an old time POA breeder. I'm not going to name names, but he said I had this wrong and he didn't believe in this list. Well, Mr. Poling was a psychiatrist from uh, Kansas and he drove to the Boomhauer Barrett dispersal sale in the early 60s. And on his way home, he was killed in a car crash. And he was the president of the POA at the time uh, when this happened. Well, that was like in 63. Well, in 64 or 5, a POA by a quarter horse stallion named Powwow, I'm going to screw it up now, but he won 30 classes. People would know him. But anyway, he won 30 classes all by himself. But he was bred after Mr. Poling died. It was a, somebody else bought his prefix, bought his farm. And they raised that colt. So that's why those two are separated. They're not together, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, Powwow, I can't believe it's my name. Uh, but I'll, we'll get to his sire, and then maybe I'll show you that, because his sire's high up with 30 wins. Uh, Powwow War Bars, something like that. Powwow something bars. But anyway, um, he's got 30 wins there, and then, of course, he's down there with... 28 and a half there. Powwow zip bars, maybe. They said powwow zip something. Yeah, it could be powwow zip bars. I think bars is in it. But when we get to his sire, I'll talk about it. So anyway, in between there, in between his farm that was purchased by somebody else and his name is three great pre POA names. Uh, Erdman, of course, Bill Erdman, and then his daughter, Sue. She married and became uh, Bettenhausen. They had Rusty Bars, and that's a lot of their wins there. Rusty Bars became a great POA sire. Uh, Bob Stolfus, not connected to John Stolfus. Bob was in Illinois. He had uh, some good POAs. I believe he had 7M's Warriors Bonnet for a while. Uh, and then, of course, Keystone, all the GR POAs. Uh, he brought up a lot of POAs from down south and registered a lot of POAs. And uh, There's a lot of great GR POAs. They have 29 wins. Wilson and Sons, they're right up there. Uh, they're coming up. Of course, that's Brad Wilson, and that's the Wills POA. So they've climbed. They had zero wins when I started this list. So they have went the last 30 years almost to 30 wins. They had quite a few POAs win in 2020. Uh, the Wills Sudden and Sudden This and stuff like that, of course. they had. He had uh, CHR. Uh, Tiger's Tough Eagle was one of his stallions for a while. And then uh, pal uh, George Jones, and he got the Wills horse that won grand by him. Uh, so he's continually climbing. There's pulling, as I mentioned. Of course, a couple older breeders. Uh, Barbara and Ray Klein is the B Klein from Colorado. They bred for a lot of great POAs. Klein's Bold Legend won a lot of stuff. He was in Wisconsin for a long time. Then, of course, Plotted's High Bar was actually a Klein's. Ruth Picoy changed his name. He won Grand Champion uh, Stallion. So that's some of their halter wins there. Uh, okay, so that's Barbara Klein. And then John Ludwig, of course, the Danny boy. He had his own chapter, uh, own uh, episode, I should say, a few uh, weeks back when we talked about Danny boy. So the Danny Boy stuff haltered real well, too, and, of course, they were fast. So that's a lot of their wins. Uh, Bob Warns and, Warns and Sharon Beck, of course, they separated, went their own ways. Of course, Bob's passed away now. Sharon continued to breed uh, when she uh, remarried and became uh, Sharon Beck. A lot of people affectionately call her Miss Sharon. Uh, she had dual plotted. She raised a lot of nice... Uh, uh, halter POAs and some good POAs in general. Of course, a cornerstone of her breeding program was Magnolia Girl, a beautiful mare, nice looking, mighty optic daughter. So, of course, some more great confirmation POAs. Uh, they have 26 and a half wins. Uh, Fred and Jan Bruner is next. That is the straw POAs. And uh, it's funny by a quarter horse stallion that they didn't get any halter wins, but they were such beautiful movers and such graceful looking POAs. And that's all the straw POAs. That's 26 wins. Mac and Nancy Kinchlow are up there for 26. Uh, Shannon from Texas, she's bred for some grand champions. The grand, she's still breeding. Of course, her, I keep saying the term cornerstone, but uh, her few spot mare, that's her uh, sugar mama down there. 
of course, is the Supreme Britches Array. She's done a great job crossing her to some horse stallions, bringing in some new horse blood as well. And uh, that's going to, for generations to come, that's going to help improve POAs. So she's had uh, some good wins. Again, she only breeds about two mares a year, so, so to have 26 wins is great. C and J Thomas, of course, that's Cliff and Joan from California. They're the LVO. They've made a good name for themselves with the LVOs. Uh, LVOs respects Poco Bian's been doing a good job lately. Uh, Aaron Brown is one of the top exhibitors in POAs the last 20 years or so. And of course, uh, Dwayne Sinkle is her uh, stepdad. And they have 25 and a half. Ruth Pequoy is a famous name in POAs. She bred for a long time. She was kind of like Max Nebregal. You know, she would sell POAs. She'd get them and sell them. So she actually got more famous as kind of buying and selling POAs than as a breeder. Uh, but she did breed. You know, she bred his signal fire that went on to win uh, Grand Gilding several, many times for the Astons. So, uh She's up there on the second page. Chuck Patterson, 22 and a half in halter. Uh, Debbie Abernathy, or Peggy Abernathy, I'm sorry. I'm just going by the first letter here. Of course, she's on this list. Invitation to look, the famous halter gilding. Tom Wamsley would know him very well, spent a major part of his life with Tom. Uh, he won grand champion gilding, I don't know, five or six times. That's most of those uh, 18 wins there. Uh, and that's probably pretty much all the 22 wins. So, and then we go here, the Keegans, uh, of course, Donovan's. Uh, Lori Chrome is an up-and-comer breeder. Now, sometimes people can be breeding for 20 years, and it takes a while for their wins to start catching up to them, and Lori's one of those. She's like an overnight success story that took 20 years to happen. Um, the DK POAs are really doing well. She breeds for some loud colored POAs and great moving POAs and her numbers just steadily climb and she's at 22 and she's tied with a famous POA program from back in the day, the Van Eyck's from Florida. That's wooden chew. Uh, of course, uh, they, they bred Kitty Van Eyck is in the hall of fame and there's been a lot of famous wooden chew POAs. One of my favorite early time breeders, they quit POAs a long time ago, and uh, but they bred for some famous POAs, and that's the Lannans. They put some pretty heads on their POAs and added some app bloods, blood as well. Uh, they were really heavy in the 60s breeding POAs. Uh, McNellis, I believe that could be the breeder designer britches. I might be wrong, but uh, Rodney Miller, he still has a POA going for sure, and that's uh, Hollywood... Uh, rm's hollywood red i believe is his name and uh, he's i think um, ashley mckenzie has him right now sheree ogden uh, she's the jof jazzy o farm uh, jof skip a scotch won a lot of these classes for her she had another win win a couple i believe but uh, skip a scotch was a great looking mare uh, she never won in halter she was always up against some stiff competition uh, but she's won a lot of performance classes uh, the Shockers from Missouri, they had Avatars Mucho, and then Stucky, Charlie Bropes, a famous POA promoter and breeder. He had Mighty Optic. He had the Bright Horses. Mighty Optic was a Bright Eyes brother, grandson, and own son of Mighty Bright, and he had him most of his life, and uh, he spent his whole career as a POA sire. Of course, Charlie showed a lot of his own brights and won a lot of these halter classes himself. And then rounding out the... Second page here is Bob Corrett, who uh, became the president after his good friend, Mr. Poling, passed away. He took over as president of the board, all those Correttes. And when I type this out all the time, I got to be careful because there's been probably 12 or so Corrette stallion sire winners, and it'll autocorrect to Corvette from Corrette. And if I'm not careful, I miss that, so I got to turn off the the spell check and of course i like spell check so uh, but anyway they bred for some great early day uh, poas the correttes so that's the end of page two and i said i was going to move along a little faster and that's what we're going to do now i'm just going to put that up so you guys can look at it we got some pretty well-known names there larry Koss, janelle mcdowell burton people see her at the show this week she's a good uh, handler 
and uh, she's bred for some great POAs. And lately, too, she's had Grand Champion Gilding, Grand Champion Stallion. Last year was the Grand Champion Stallion she raised, and then, of course, his full brother, Third Day, was won the Gildings a few years back. Excuse me. Bob Moser is on this list. Uh, that's the seven M's. Irene Nelson was in Minnesota. Lada Dada was the one that won those classes for her. He was a name change. Tommy Tomlin is still climbing the list. He's another breeder, uh, kind of like Lori Chrome, that's been around quite a while, and his POAs are starting to catch fire now. The CHR, uh, Rio Tough, KK's Rio Tough was the cornerstone of his operation, and uh, he bred her to uh, pal chip and putt and created some really good few spots. My buddy Tracy Keen's on here. Of course, her um, family, the Bolvins and the Sweets, and then she married and became Tracy Keen. Uh, she's climbing the list with her new stay, and she had Speaker of the House. Of course, before that, Doc Stuff Tiger, and now the TC uh, Impulsive Weedo Horse is really doing a good job. So her numbers are steadily climbing. Les Boomhauer, the founder of the POAs. Of course, he won a lot of the early day classes. Uh, then we go Kathy McKenzie. A lot of people don't realize she's raised some POAs. Uh, she bred her great mare, HMH Super Sox. They only bred her one year, and they chose uh, my family staying, Kiddo Tough. We shipped semen down and uh, ended up with the, they ended up with the Caribbean Kid, and he's won a lot of these classes. He actually is on the sires list, too, as three. He has three wins as a sire, but then they gilded him, and he's still showing today. He won in 2020. John Stofus, great name from Ohio, hardworking guy, uh, bred the cash horses and stuff. He had series spot cash for years and years. Uh, Harold Slagle is Hive of Avatars breeder. Charlie Densmore has been around a long time. Again, a great exhibitor and showed Tudor bars as a kid and uh, as a teenager. And then she's bred for some great POAs, had Two Eyes Sunny all those years. Mark Kozer is the Scheidecker son-in-law. He had some good POAs. Of course, the Ottens from Missouri are famous. Cecil Lofton was a friend of Mike Gardner's. He's on this list. There's the Roselands are on here about three times. You have the Roseland family that was raising POAs way back when. And then Lowell Roseland bred for some winners, mainly by uh, the Sudden Impulse was the Appaloosa Stay, and he had, and then him and Olin Stoley had him in a partnership. And, of course, Bob Roseland is still breeding his uh, – Skipper W. Bread Wieskamp type uh, POAs in Iowa, and he's on this list as well. So uh, Jeremy Stevens, he's created a lot of those wins. His daughter's won uh, quite a few uh, gaming classes the last couple years. They also had some success with uh, some young halter stuff, and uh, they're still breeding. He has three or four stallions. The Barringers from Illinois, of course, Kathy grew up in POAs, and then her and Mike, their two sons showed, and they have the truly POAs. Uh, we go through here. Mowers are from Tipton, Iowa, just like Max Nebregal. They had the Triple R's. Caswell's, uh, they had Kiddo Tough, and then they had Bounce Back Jack. JBJ's Outback Jack was actually bred by the Caswell's. He won in 2020, and uh, so that's from Larry and Don there. That Larry is uh, Gordy's son. The Pony Farm is on here. Of course, they've been coming up over the years. Jess Drish has done a great job helping out uh, Barb and Susie. And uh, they have a famous career there, the Pony Farm, a lot of POAs. And, uh, of course, they have RPR's Impulsive Superman that's doing a good job for them. I remember the day Anne Demerjean called me, and she wanted to breed to an Impulse stallion. And she, ended, she wanted to know if I had anything in full to an Impulse stallion. And she ended up breeding for uh, a foal that's won all these classes. And uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name now. I knew I'd do it, but... Uh, anyway, she bred for that one. It'll come to me later. Somebody might say it watching the show. So I missed most of the show. guess I'll have to watch the video. Okay, somebody just commented that they missed quite a bit of the show. But uh, anyway, we get down. There's Max Nebergall with 13 wins. Of course, he went in the Hall of Fame last year. He had double tough. East Acres is his prefix. So like I say, we're going to go through... This list fairly fast. That was page three. We haven't been going fast. If you just joined in, we've been going really slow. So you'll want to tune in and watch. It's almost 8 o'clock. So uh, 
I'm going to go through these. I'm not going to say every name. I'm just going to leave this page up here. But this is 13 through 10. This is page 4. Again, you can go back and watch this show and kind of maybe you can pause it and study some of these. The entire list, I believe, has never been published anywhere. It needs to be on the, the website probably, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of pages, so it takes up a lot of space, and uh, it changes every year. That's another thing. I always have to update it so it can't stay static on a place like the website. The next page here starts out with Bob York from South Dakota. He bred to J.W. Chisholm, had some POAs by him. Emery Davis was a famous POA name. We go all the way down to there's Bob Roseland. Uh, at the end of the page, there's some famous names on this page. D. Kenny is in there. Some older names like the Cornelius, uh, Cacavelli from Connecticut. Uh, there's some famous names in there. So Premier POAs was in Texas for a while. Go to the next page. I'm getting ready for the sires list. If you haven't been watching the whole show, we are going to talk about the sires list. That's going to be as interesting as this or more interesting. Uh, I told you it'd be a long show tonight. If the ecam cuts out on me, I did an update uh, tonight, so it shouldn't cut out. But it has cut out at 8 o'clock before, uh, but hopefully it doesn't cut out. Move on to the next page. We'll do some horse noises as you're looking at the stuff there. So now we're into the sevens all the way down to some of the fives. Uh, Ed Sammons is on the top of this page there. He's been breeding for quite a while. And in Iowa, you have some older Minnesota breeders like Carl Oz and Wally Cates. Butch Hammer, them were all from Hammer's High Flyer. He won, grand, won uh, the small stallion year after year. He was the baby winner as a weanling, I believe in 74 in Missouri. And then when he became an age stallion, he won the small age stallions, I think five times. And that's the six wins there for Butch Hammer. Of course, Moyers from Iowa. Uh, Greg Hall from Illinois, bred POAs for quite a while. Olin Stoley's on this list. Uh, quite a few names people recognize here. Lynn Buzzkirk from Oklahoma, John Berger, John and Linda from New York. They raised their kids in POAs. The Daltons had some race POAs. Of course, Carnes, they show some of uh, Jan Rogers stuff, but they've also bred some of their own stuff. They're on this page. I might have the wrong one up there. So here's some more fours. We got a whole page of fours. So that shows you, you know, that's just everybody that's bred for four. Again, the first column is halter. Second column is performance. If you happen to see a mistake, sometimes my eyes get blurry typing all this out, just let me know. If you see a zero, three, four, or something like that, or a one, two, and it don't add up to four, uh, let me know. But I've proofread these things over and over, but sometimes you can't catch everything. Here's the last few fours and then the three and a halfs. And then we go to the threes. Again, if you're just tuning in later and you didn't miss the introduction, I talked for quite a while about how I put these lists together and the rules and stuff. And uh, that the halves are from Marin Full, that's in Halter. And then uh, there was a match pair class. That if there was, there was two in that, that won. So I gave the breeder a half a win each if it was bred by two different people which usually it was now on the bottom of this page is jay kennedy not to be confused with john kennedy but that is his son jim kennedy and i've talked to the family and they said just keep it separate i believe it was ltd was his prefix but he bred some poas of course he used cody too but he bred for some poas and they won i think he had ltds mr roberts might have been one of his uh, but he's had three wins. Here's some more threes, and we get down to the two and a halfs. Henry Rogers was an early POA breeder and a director. Les Boomhar, when I talked to him, he remembered Henry Rogers. He had tumbleweed, 
the first mayor that repeated his grand champion. She was the second and third grand champion mayor at the national show. He also had an Appaloosa stallion named Peter Kay, who was pretty famous in the uh, Midwest, and he had a foal by him in Tumbleweed named Little Peter Kay that was making a name for himself. He passed away fairly young. Uh, Henry Rogers did, or he probably would have made a bigger name for himself in POAs. We're talking way back in the 50s and early 60s. Here's a whole page of twos. Like I say, there's a bunch of Browns on the list. There's some Davises. Uh, there's just all kinds of names on there that, you know, I've never met most of these people. It'd be cool to run across some of these, the relatives of some of these. I'm sure a lot of these people have passed on. A lot of them quit breeding POA. Some of them never realized they bred for a, a winner maybe or whatever, but some of these are, are well-known POA people as well. Another whole page of twos, and I'm not going to show any of the ones. Like I said earlier, there is uh, five pages of ones on the breeders list, so we're not going to go. So you can see alphabetically we're getting close to the end. And there, there it is. There's ones right there. That's just because it's on the same page as the, the twos. Again, some of these names here are up-and-comers. They're breeding for quite a few POAs. Some of them, they're going to... They're going to climb up the list. So that moves us to the sires. I'm going to try to speed through there. Hopefully I can get this podcast done by 9 o'clock if Ecamm will stay with me. Uh, that would be a large show, I know. But you could always watch it in sections if you want to. Sorry for the paper paper wrangling here. Just moving everything around. I just want to leave this list up here, kind of let it marinate, let people look at it. There's a lot going on on this list here. So this is the first page of the Sires list. Again, this is the Sires of International Show, National Congress Class Winners. As we know, the show was changed, the name of it, but it's the same show. Uh, it was changed to National Congress, so I just kept the list the same. And the Silver Kid has come up like gangbusters. Again, he's one of them that when I started this in 93, he wasn't born yet. He was born in 95. The cool thing about the Silver Kid is his pedigree based on this list. If you go off of this list like a lot of people do, I always put a lot of stock in this list. Uh, his pedigree is in the purple for sure because he's a grandson of Kiddo Tough, who he surpassed. Kiddo Tough was number one for quite a while, and he got passed by his grandson, the Silver Kid. The Silver Kid's sire is Hive Avatar. If you slip down to number 14, there's Hive Avatar. Of course, Hive Avatar had a great career as a sire. His sire was Ceres Silver Prince, who's number 17. So, I mean, that's that's quite a pedigree there. Uh, three generations, Series Silver Prince, Hive Avatar, and then the Silver Kid. And then you consider Kiddo Tough, the grandsire on the mare side, is second. Of course, the Silver Kid's pushed by all his silver babies, mainly in performance. I mentioned Patrick was his first halter winner way back when. Well, now the Damon's have the Silver Kid standing back on their place. Of course, they're the breeders of him. Uh, they took a mare that was raised by my family and uh, the Crisco Kid's full sister, Kid's Double Sweet, and bred her uh, to Avatar to get the Silver Kid, who is a few spot. And uh, he's the first stallion to go over 200 wins. He's at 206. He had 24 wins as a sire last year. That isn't the first time he's done that. Uh, but I believe it was 24, and he's just been chomping up there for a while. He'd have like 20, then the next year he'd have maybe 8 to 10, and then the next year he'd have 20, 24 again. It just depends who comes to the show, and sometimes, you know, like last year with COVID or might be the economy or something's going on in somebody's life or the kid had something going on, dance, 
camp at the nationals or who knows what and you don't go to the show or that pony doesn't get shown or they have an off show but it's just all that those things are factored in there and it's again it's about getting the poas in the right show hands so uh the silver kid like we say number one kiddo tough uh 24 wins and halter 147 the crisco kid is his uh big winner but he's also had a lot of other wins uh, he was only owned by four people he was bred by my family the Rorks, and then he was sold to our farrier who became a good friend of ours he got in back into poas because of us that was gordy caswell he purchased kiddo uh, when we uh, quit raising poas for a while due to health issues and stuff and uh, so then they had him there ranked i think they have 13 wins and then of course jackie and the Krugers purchased him in a partnership. They're both high up on the list of breeders. And then, of course, we're in the top 10, too. We bought him back when he was 16. Uh, so he uh, outdid Tough Plot it on the list. Tough Plot it was number one for quite a while. It was Chief Little Britches. Uh, I don't believe Paper Tiger was never number one, but he's always been in, he's been in the top five for a long time. Uh, but he couldn't go past uh, Chief Little Bridges for a long time, and by the time he did, Tough Plot it had went ahead of him. So you have four stallions, unlike the 11 breeders that have 100 wins, you only have four stallions, because of course you have a lot more stallions out there uh, than breeders. So uh, Chief Little Bridges is staying, that's, that number's static, that number won't go up. Paper Tiger actually could have one maybe show up, it's gonna be a rough, rougher now with his age you know and tough plot it's been gone for a long time and guess what he had two wins this last year in 2020 santi noches came and won two kiddo tough had i think 11 wins this last year and he hasn't had a full since 07 was his last full crop i'm a silver royal he's up on that list because hmh super socks uh chocolatey has come out of nowhere i mean he He's the stay in the success story of this list. Of course, he's the number one Appaloosa. The rest of them above him are all uh, POAs, and uh, he surpassed all the other Appaloosas, and he had a lot of wins again this year. So he's been well promoted. A lot of people has bred to him. Of course, Doc Nemers was the first POA breeder to breed to him, and then a lot have since and still continue to breed to him. And uh, in a short period of time, 85 wins, that's unbelievable how fast he got to. Him and the Silver Kid probably reached their numbers faster than anybody. Kiddo was pretty fast, uh, but Chocolatey has just climbed so fast. And he's going to continue to go up, of course, and so will the Silver Kid. The Silver Kid's still siring, so he's got a lot of foals out there. Uh, Santee Cody just got tied this year with Chocolatey, and uh, they're tied for 7th. So that pushed First Impulse down to ninth, and uh, he has 76. Again, he was the youngest stallion on the list for a long time, as high as he was. He's even younger than the Silver Kid. So my trivia question the other night on Facebook, kind of a trivia question. It was just a teaser for this show. The three stallions that weren't born yet when I started these lists were the Silver Kid, Chocolatey, and First Impulse, the three in the top ten, that is. So the other ones were all born uh, before that. So, of course, Gold Prince, he was sitting uh, up there probably about six for quite a while with 85 and a half wins. But then uh, those four came and got him, and he's still in the top ten. He just slipped this year. Uh, First Impulse and Chocolatey both went by him this year. Uh, so he dropped two places down to tenth place. Uh, but still respectable considering he wasn't alive very long and he was an Appaloosa too and hardshipped as a POA, uh, 75 wins. Salty three bars, he's on there mainly because of Tudor bars. Tudor bars won pretty much all those, uh, 59 of them. Ladies Warrior, I'm surprised he isn't higher than that. Uh, 64 and a half is a lot of wins, but there was a lot of famous 7Ms. If they would have kept breeding longer, he, he probably would have, one more, and I think he passed away like at 16. He was owned his whole life by the Moser family. Plotus Crusader was owned his whole life by the Victors. They bred him. Uh, they almost sold him once or twice, but uh, he was a little few spot. A lot of the Plotus in uh, those POAs from Iowa, the Victors, uh, they were by Plotus Crusader. 
high the avatar. He started out his career as a great futurity sire, and then he had some grand champions, and then he became known as a performance sire, and he had some really good performance POAs. J.K. Supreme Scooter. Of course, Scooter is the Bagwells, RBRs. He was bred by uh, John Anderson from South Dakota, who I'm happy that's breeding POAs again. He was kind of out for a while, and uh, he was breeding some court horses and stuff. Of course, he likes Wee's Camp uh, type breeding and Santee, but he's raised some good ones over the years, and J.K.'s Supreme Scooter is one of the greatest sires of all time, and he's here ranked uh, number 15. Windridge Sundance is on here because of one POA, and that's Shoto. That's all 54 wins. A uh, little different case with J.N. Ghost the Gold. He had a lot of J.N. foals bred by the Katzenbergers, so those 52 wins are from a lot of different POAs. And uh, he's, he's made a great name for himself. He's a Hall of Famer. And then he's tied with Sirius Silver Prince. Sirius Silver Prince, because he had the graying gene and stuff, and he started out in Arizona. He wasn't known to POAs very well until he was about five or six when Paula Cooper consigned him to the national sale. But then when he went to the Midwest, kind of the hotbed of POAs at the time, a lot of great breeders started breeding to him. But I believe he only had like 40-some registered foals. So to have 52 wins from only 40-some, he's probably, of all the sires on this list for sure, he's had the fewest. I mean, chocolatey maybe. I don't know how many... POA foals he's had, but it's getting as close as many as Sirius Silver Prince had. Then you have a couple Doc Stallions on there, Doc's toughest yet that he used for a while. Then, of course, he went out to Utah, and he's been used at different places. Then Rough and Tough, Doc sold him as a baby, and the Damons have had him the whole time. He's an 89 model. He's right up there. He rounds out the top 20. k and Monty's Award was the top Appaloosa for many years, not counting the hard-shipped ones like Gold Prince. Uh, he never was hard-shipped. He's still up there with 48. He would be second now uh, in the Appalo for Appaloosas. Got another Docs. Of course, Docs Tough Dude was one of the first great Doc Stallions, the son of Double Tough. Him and Double Tough were tied for a long time. And I want to show you how blood, you know, the blood really works. And I'm going to show you here. Blood will show up in anything good or bad and you're going to see that in these lists if i got time to go through that and of course dude's sire is down there at 25 so father and son are ranked 22 and 25 and that's of course the famous double tough and then right above them in between them is quivera yoka chief that would have been rutledge's stallion that's where the yoka comes from and chigger pep salty gotta look uh vanderworks bred for a a great gilding by him, and then of course Lynn had some salties by Salty Gotta Look, and uh, that's why he's up there so high. Of course, he's in the Hall of Fame. R.Y. Major Equity was lost a little too soon to us, uh, but he was a beautiful stallion, and he won some. Now, yeah, keep that in mind. Some of these POAs won stuff for their own too. You know, they that don't count here. They won for their breeder and their sire. But these wins are just from their foals. So like Major Equity, you know, all his wins would count for his uh, breeder, the gardeners, and for his sire. Russ T-Bars, they did well with his babies and halter, and they were pretty good moving uh, POAs. And then V-Sudden Impulse is the fastest mover right now in this area. He, I believe he had 13 wins. He jumped from 30 in 2019 after that show. He had 30 wins. Last year, his foals won 13 classes. So that took him from the second page all the way up here to the first page. And, of course, he's a son of the famous Impulse Corridor Stay and a sudden impulse. And then Tucson Bob is a legend in the POA breed. His Suncrest POAs made him famous. Kiddo Bounce is still coming up. He wasn't used very heavy till he was 10. And then Jackie uh, Guthrie has really put him on the map. Of course, Jackie likes to show halter horses and show her babies and stuff, so that's a lot of the wins there. Of course, that great mare that's been the grand champion the last two years, she's a tremendous mare. Uh, she's got six wins on this list, at least, from those two. And then, you know, the kiddo bounces. He's a son of kiddo tough, so they're going to ride, so they're starting to gain some performance wins, too. 
And we got some Appaloosa stallions. I'm not sure if Gene ever hardship Super Sun or not. I wasn't sure that he did when he, I started these lists. He wasn't. So, of course, Bill Coulter's had Super Sun, and then he, Gene had him, had a lot of Santees by him. He's also the sire of Darlin' Jill, so that's a lot of wins there. And a lot of people in Wisconsin bred to him. Now, we'll talk. We'll skip Alias Ghost King for a minute, talk about Pal Calvacade. He's up there. He's the highest pal from the Kennedys. He's been at several different programs like the Spencers and stuff. Uh, he has 41 wins. But let's take a look at the stallion right ahead of him and the two below him. And this is unbelievable if you think about it. Alias Ghost King, the Appaloosa, 12 and 29. And then Smoky Pants, 6 and 35. And KS's JW White Lighting, 6 and 34. What did all three of those stallions have in common? They were all owned by KS's Pony Farm. So they had Paper Tiger for a long time. He's number four, and his numbers are six and 96. And then you have these three, whose numbers are almost spitting images of each other, mirror images. You know, you got some halter wins and then a lot of performance wins. And that's just a uh, shout out to the Steels program with all the great mares they had. But they have four stallions they owned on the first page. I mean, that's unbelievable. And three of them are almost. Right, I mean, actually, if it was not because of alphabetical, if you put Pal Calvacate ahead of Alias Ghost King, they're tied, you would have three of them right in a row uh, at 41, 41, and 40. So just unbelievable. Of course, Alias Ghost King was a half-brother to Dreamfinder, one of the greatest halter Appaloosa sires of all time. So the fact that Alias Ghost King has double halter numbers of the other three uh, steel stallions uh, is no no mistake there that makes perfect sense so that covers that star acres top brass of course had i think brass blitz and brass buckles they were gaming poas tmd's two-eyed rawhide is kind of like kiddo bounce there are two of them on here that are going to keep going up uh, they of course uh, rpr's impulsive superman like i said earlier jess grish is doing a great job with him 